Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. It's been a beautiful week for me, beautiful last couple days. I recently got back into good old Fallout 4, the game that came out, I don't know, about maybe 10 years ago, to some uh, criticism, of course, when it comes out, as any game does, but recently... It has updated. The game has been updated. Bethesda has released um, a next-gen update for Xbox Series X and S and PlayStation 5, where it gives you the ability to now run the game at a glorious 60 frames per second. Of course, it's also adding a couple new things. I, th- I believe like some... Uh, other other power armor, some cosmetic things, and you know a next gen upgrade essentially. And for me, the big selling point to me for this game was the 60 frames per second and performance mode. I gotta tell you, man, I think that this game, you know, coming back to it because I've played it. I mean, one time when it came out. And then I went back to it maybe about four years ago and tried playing it again. Did not finish it. Um, But coming back now in 2024, you know, after, um, you know, the success of the Fallout show, which I haven't finished, by the way, about more than halfway through, but I haven't finished it yet. But But by the way, that show is phenomenal. I love everything about the Fallout TV show. Everything about it is so far phenomenal. Um, But adding that, you know, 60 FPS update to Fallout 4 has me pretty much hooked on that game. I started playing it last week, um, and then I was recently playing it um, this past weekend, and man, this game is so good. And it's so refreshing to play it at a 60 frames per second. It feels like a brand new game. Honestly, it feels like a like a legit a brand new game. And I think that because of the success of the show has made me want to play more and more Fallout, which is what I've been doing. And going back into playing Fallout. And it has been a blast so far. Like, I know what's going to happen in Fallout 4. I know what's going to happen in this game. There's nothing that's going to surprise me, obviously. I haven't, I mean, I don't think I've bought any of the DLC, so maybe if there's DLC that for purchase, I'll get that. But so far, so good. I mean, it's as, as good as I imagined. It's even better in, in other ways. Like I said, the, the 60 frames per second thing makes it feel like a brand new game, like a freshly polished game. Now, I don't want these developers and these companies to hear this part of what I'm saying because they'll probably just do that with their other games and make them 60 frames per second and be like, oh, I thought you said that this is going to feel like a new game. And I'll just do that for all our games. I don't want that to happen, but at the moment, the next-gen Fallout 4 update is badass. It's pretty awesome. In fact, I think that I want to play that more than Starfield at the moment. Like, Fallout 4 is an awesome game. And I'm not like a Fallout um, connoisseur. I've only played 3 and 4 and 76. And I think that 4 is probably my favorite one. So definitely the most Um, in my opinion, action-packed Fallout game. It definitely just seems more my pace and my speed. However, when I did was booting it up and when I was playing it again, I remember there was a critique back in the day. There was a critique about the dialogue options in Fallout 4. There's only four that you can choose from, 
in each conversation and it's it's they're locked to the buttons on your controller a b x y um x circle triangle square when it, you know whatever controller you're playing on or you know if you're playing on a switch i guess it's the same but whatever um there are only four options and recently when i was playing starfield like maybe about a month ago a month or two ago there was a lot more dialogue options it was much more like a skyrim or i've heard it's more like oblivion but you know much more options in um in those games and um the responses in fallout 4 are like very minimal from your character and i also remember that people didn't like how the character that you were playing as had a voice and had like a specific story like you know the story in fall 4 is you're a dad that's trying to find his son so it's like you know that's your story i mean i guess in like starfield and the oblivion it's a little bit more um it's a little bit more open i guess you can kind of be uh, your own person, kind of make your own journey, I guess. It's a little bit more role-playing, I guess you can say, than, like, storyly driven. But still, I think that, you know, when we replaying this, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember, like, there was, like, a lot of criticism besides this or because of this, and a lot of people that I knew were not the biggest fans of this particular choice. And I remember playing it recently, like, oh, I, I don't care. Like, I liked it back then. And I still like it now. I think that it was a phenomenal choice. I think that anything, you know, anything was bad about it, honestly. Um, but I was hooked. I mean, I was hooked again. I'm like, damn, you know, this is just hitting so well. You know, the the classic Fallout wandering experience. I mean, there is like, there's like pretty much nothing better in a gamer's world than to boot up Fallout 4, to wander the wasteland, turning on your Pip-Boy radio, tuning into Diamond City radio station on your Pip-Boy, and wandering to The Wanderer and Atom Bomb Baby. Like, that is a a, a memory that I, that I recently reignited from replaying this game, and I was like, oh, baby, I'm back. I'm back in the Commonwealth. I'm back. I'm back on Fallout 4. I was I was like speechless. You know, I know it's very cliché, but I was just like, dude, this is amazing. And now I got my friends texting me and chatting like, "Hey, why don't you get Fallout 76 again?" And I was thinking to myself like, I'll do it. I'll get it. I was a little, um, I was a little hesitant to re-download it, even though it's on Game Pass, but hey, your boy bought it day one, so, you know, kind of an, uh, kind of a bad decision on my part, so I have it, I own it, essentially, I can play it whenever the hell I want, you know, whenever, whatever makes me want to, I can do it, so I am going to do it, it's just that I don't know if Fallout 76 is also 60 frames per second. I think that it's not. I think it's not. I could be wrong, but if it is not a 60 frame per second game, man, it's going to be tough for me to want to, you know, play it that much. And I remember saying this on this podcast. When I first got my Series X, I tried very, very hard to play... Fallout 76 on my Series X because on my old Xbox One it was having some trouble towards the end of its life and I could not play that game and I thought because I'm getting a new console because I'm getting an upgrade I I was just thinking like okay well maybe the game will run better if I play it on this it obviously didn't and I, I think the first time I went back to playing 76 when I first got my Series X, I kid you not, I'm pretty sure within 20 minutes the game crashed. And I was just like, nope. And then I uninstalled so quickly. And I was just like, yo, this ain't, this ain't gonna fly. 
and I uninstalled. I haven't reinstalled it since. But my friends, you know, they, they want to play. They, we've been gaming a lot. We've been playing different games here and there. I got into Diablo 4. I never thought that I would be getting into Diablo 4. In my wildest dreams, would I ever think that I would be a person that plays Diablo 4? I love it. I love Diablo 4. It is it is such an addictive game. Whoever designed it, whoever designed how um, the way you pick up loot, the way you pick up gold and, and uh, you know, heals and everything in that game, it, 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 like, triggers your brain like, yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing very, very well. In that game... The currency is gold, and it's not like a rare currency. It's very, very, very prominent in the game. It's everywhere, and when you get it, you get a lot of it every time. It's not like in Fallout where you find one cap on a table, and then that's all you find in that entire room. No, there's gold. People drop gold when you kill them in that game and in chests, and in around a tree, and around a dead body, it's just like, the game was clearly designed to, to get you to get addicted, and to keep on going, because it's a top-down viewing game, right, it's not like a spectacle to look at, the cutscenes are pretty cool, but the gameplay, top-down view, graphics are pretty cool, they're not like the best thing you've ever seen, but it, the gameplay itself, it just makes you want to keep playing, and the story's pretty cool, and also the fact that you can play with your friends, throughout the story and do quests and do missions and do like um, events kill a boss do like a challenge thing it's pretty cool it's a cool thing I think so um, I, I I feel like a game like that that at least you know to my knowledge uh, you know when I'm playing the story when I'm playing the side missions um, it doesn't really require me to uh, make any you know how, how would you say this, make any additional purchases in terms of like, I need to buy this in order order to advance uh, the story or I have to buy that in order to um, get a specific item which I will need to beat this character like that. I'm happy that it is not like that because, at least for me, I know it's more of a recent game and it hasn't been out for that long, but I feel like that game, Diablo, could potentially go that route, but I'm not so sure it will. I don't even know if I'll be honestly playing it when I f after I finish the main story. I have no idea. All I know is that I'm having a lot of fun with it. And it's a game where I feel like I don't really need to think all that much, you know? First-person shooters like Call of Duty, Warzone, PUBG, I need to think. I need to be on high alert. I got to be in the zone. I got to be athletic. I got to be fast. I got to be have a lot of momentum, and I have to, um, you know, uh, unleash hell. Right? I, I need to compete in those games in order to do well, in order for our team to do well. That way we win. I got to be on my A game with those games. Diablo... I don't got to do anything. I just got to, you know, run forward, go where I need to go, attack the bad guys, and then move on. That's it. That's all I got to do. It ain't too hard. It doesn't require much skill whatsoever. The only skill like you really uh, need to do or you really need, I guess, is like dodging enemies and making sure that you heal before you die. Sometimes I'll be, you know, within the midst of a fight. I'll be having a good time. I'll think I'm, you know, doing pretty good. All of a sudden, I get popped a couple times, and I'm dead. And I got to have my friends revive me and bring me back to life. You know, but we you know, we do that with each other. You know, we, we bring each other back and everything. But it's still like something like you got to make sure that you're not dying too frequently because I think that if you do, you know, your gear is not as good as it was before you died, I believe. Something along the lines of that, but... That's like the only real like thing that I, that you kind of worry about is, you know, making sure that you don't die or making sure, making sure that you heal 
and you're not, you know, being too confident or too cocky to go into a fight. But if you got friends, it's not too bad. It's not that bad at all. It's it's actually pretty freaking fun. Like it's a fun, fun game that I think that a lot of people, if they give it a shot, will have a lot of good time. You know, we begin to that. That's a recent thing that I've been like, yo, this is sick. Another game that I have been, you know, requested to get, and I really didn't want to get it at all. I did end up getting it. And the first time I started to play it, I was somewhat enjoying it. And then recently, my friends wanted to play it again. I ended up hating it and uninstalled it. That game was Destiny 2. A couple of my friends were like, hey, I used to play this. We should all play it. They're like, yeah, let's do it. And then they got it. They're like, hey, this is kind of cool. And I asked my one of my other friends, like, hey, I, I can't believe you actually like this. And he was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. And I'm like, you know what? I guess I'll give it a shot. Gave it a shot. First playthrough was all right. I was doing like the main quest stuff. And by the way, I've never played a Destiny game in my life. So I had to like make like a bungee account and everything, and get that going, get that settled, and then start from scratch, essentially, and then, you know, I had to do the tutorial by myself, you know, play through all that, and then, and then open, you know, you know, get my bearings, do some stuff in the world by myself, just, just so I can, like, get, like, a feel of what it is, and then I think, I'm pretty sure, like, you have to do, like, stuff by yourself before you play with your friends, because it's, like, gotta walk you through, like, how the game works, then I linked up my friends, playing some of the, the, the campaign quests. I'm like, you know what? This is kind of cool. You know, it's like an open world type thing. First person, kind of like Diablo, but a little bit more, I would say, not as engaging. Just because I feel like games like that, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, you know, like an open world type of multiplayer, almost like a MMO type game, but I know Destiny's not that. I feel like those are kind of better when they're like not first person, you know. Even though 76 is, I would say, a much more watered down MMO than like Diablo or I I, I guess like a Destiny, whatever. You know, it's not really that, but it's similar to that. Um, where I really did not have a good time was, and I noticed it as soon as we uh, we did it, we decided to do like um, some type of mission to get loot, to get things. And that's where I noticed that, oh yeah, I remember why people um, really did not like Destiny. And one of the things was it's grindy. Like the whatever mission that we did, I don't know if it was a raid or some something else, just getting like, you know, mission or getting loot, but like the way that the mission went about just felt like very mindless and very grindy and not really working towards anything but getting loot. And not really progressing any type of story that you're like invested in. And I was like, wait a minute. I I remember back in the day where like people were like saying like they were doing raids and raids and raids and all that stuff and gearing up for raids. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. Now I remember why I didn't want to play in the first place and why a lot of people did not like the game in the first place is because of the grindy aspect and I learned this the hard way. I played that Avengers game for like 20 minutes. And I was like, nope, not for me. And I realized after we played this mission in Destiny 2, the same thing. Nope, this ain't for me. This is, I'm not going to fall for this again because this feels exactly like Avengers, but first person. The, the grindy for like, you know, it, it wasn't even that long of a mission. It was like 15 minutes, but like I could just feel like, ah, oh, yeah, this is what this game's all about. Yeah, I'm out. And I uninstalled so fast, faster than I've ever uninstalled a game in my entire life. I was like, nah, 
I ain't going to be here. And even before that, I had noticed that there was a lot of things that this game wanted me to buy. Like, as soon as I would open it, as soon as I would go into an area or talk to a character, it would, like, say, like, I need to do this or do that, or you need to buy this expansion, or you got to go buy this key and this thing. I'm like, oh, no. Like, you are the very thing that I hate the most. I can't play you. Like, I just cannot support this type of game. And I realize, like, like this is like a, a culmination of many, many, many years. Because Destiny's been a long, uh, um, Destiny 2's been a game for, like, seven years. Eight or seven years, whatever it is. But, like, they've been a game for a long time. So there's a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily have to buy, but uh, you can buy, and it would make it a lot, a, probably a much better experience if you did buy, and I was just getting hit by so many advertisements to buy this expansion, to buy that expansion, this key, that key. It's like, oh, hell no, man. And I was out of there. I was just like, nope, this shit ain't for me. I cannot do it. I can't do it. I, I just could not. And I know, I knew, I knew for a fact that I was going to let a lot of people down that wanted me to get it so we can play. But let me tell you, man, I'm just not that type of dude. I don't like those grindy games, especially ones like Destiny, where you're so... The people who have been playing Destiny have been playing since the beginning for about like eight or seven years, and they got eight or seven years of content on you already and stuff like that that they bought, that they're already way ahead that if you join right now, you're going to be overflowed and overwhelmed with how much shit that you could potentially buy to make yourself better, and you realize in that moment that, oh yeah, this game requires you, maybe not requires, but heavily pushes that you purchase more things in the game to make your experience a hell of a lot better. And I was just like, oh no, I can't play this. This is a no-go for me, fellas. I mean, it was really strange how, you know, I would be like a little hub, a little courtyard on a planet, just like kind of like roaming around, and I would talk to people about quests, and I would have to actually buy expansions to do these quests and do these bounties or do these raids, and I was like, fuck that shit. Couldn't support it. It would have gone against so many of my morals to actually invest that much money, time, and effort into that game. And I'll, I would just be like, no thanks. Not for me. And I knew, I know, I know a few people that just love that game, love Destiny, love that grind, love that experience, love getting that loot the guns, the armor, the abilities, and I'm just like, no, this is just not for me. So I ended up, you know, not, uh, uninstalling and quitting when I was ahead, you know? And it kind of makes me sad how the developer that made Halo, the original Halo, made that game, made Destiny 2, and 1, obviously. I don't know, it's just not something that I would play. And I know for a fact there's a lot of people out there that love that type of game, that love that grindy stuff, that live for that, live, breathe, and die by that shit, and they love it. I just can't be, I don't think I could ever be someone who likes that stuff. I don't know, it's just like not really for me. The gameplay was kind of cool. It's a little weird at some points, it's just, it, it feels dated, you know? It feels like you move a lot slower than modern day like FPS games. Obviously, that's going to be true, but I don't know. I just can't couldn't really you know get a good feel of it. I didn't really like just killing bad guys the way you do, and just so I I don't know. I just feel like it was like so unengaging, you know. Whereas Diablo to me just was better. It was. It wasn't as complicated. 
there it, there wasn't too much to it. There's a lot to do with like upgrading your your character and all that, but it just seems more fun. The process is a lot more fun to do that type of stuff and not as I I just feel like it's more constrained in Destiny War, whereas in Diablo it's just wide open. You can just go do this or leave or do that. Whereas in Destiny, there's like a lot of like, you know, skipping ahead, cutscenes and all this stuff and traveling here to do this and then leaving and just going back to your hub. It's, I don't know, I just feel like it just is not a game that's fully optimizational in like, you know, fluidity. I, I don't know, I just, I, yeah. I get a very like stagnant, stuttery, slow game. And it's just, you know, on top of all the microtransactions that you got to buy to get the key, to get the bounty, to get the chest for this guy, to complete these bounties, to get this shoulder pad. It's like, nah, fuck off. Fuck off. No, no, just not for me. I believe that's all the news I had for video games. Oh, by the way, now I'm, I'm joking. There's more news. Starfield just yesterday, announced that they're going to have an update. Finally, an update for Starfield, an actually good update to the game that was supposed to be the game of the century, which I have now walked back that opinion, because it's not true in my opinion. Um, Within this update will be 60 frames per second. Thank you, God. A map of the city and a physical map not physical sorry but a detailed map of where you are on the planet and in the city more markers in the city and in in in, in on the planets to give you actually locations of where things are like stores and shops and you know all that stuff hangars and all that places you got to be Detailed mapping is something that I noticed that was so such a missing component in this game because every time you go to a planet and do a mission and have to walk around and you want to check your map, it would be one of the most disgusting things that would ever pop up on your screen. It was just a pixelated, on purpose, mess of gray and little icons around where you where the points of interest are and by the way these points of interest are not that great they're very boring every planet is very barren i've already talked about this before but i think that starfield fundamentally is not good because the game is so highly 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 reliant on fast traveling to do anything at a somewhat decent pace to complete the game. Like, I can't tell you how many times the last time I played Starfield, I had a fast travel about 30 times within one hour just to get, just to do story, just to do things that I had to do to get from one place to another. How many times do I got to jump in my ship from system to system to system just to do anything? And you know what that does? You know what that does? That takes away the the wonder of exploration in Bethesda games. This isn't even a part of their update, but it's just I'm reiterating of what what Starfield has done that has, in my opinion, ripped out its character and ripped out its soul of its games. The exploration is just not even there in Starfield. You can't even explore. You have no, absolutely zero motivation to explore because every mission takes you on multiple systems in each mission. And it's like, I'm just fast traveling here. Like, why, why don't, why even bother? Why? What? How can I find stuff? How can I loot things if I can't wander around? If every city I go to is habitable, has people there, none of it's abandoned. I can't, or none of it's like a thing that I gotta defeat, or you know, uh, you know, I can loot shit. Like, what is the purpose? What? Why just buy stuff and just waste money like that? I guess that's probably why in that game you also get so many credits because 
it's fundamentally a different world like than Fallout. You just can't loot anything that's in a house. Obviously, I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. But it just kind of feels like it's it goes against like what their other games were like in terms of like exploration. Like you gotta explore, you gotta wander, you gotta walk around and find stuff organically. Or you know, if you don't got the fast track, a fast travel icon available because because you've never been to this place yet, and you gotta walk a while. Well, that's part of it. You have to do it, and that's you know I feel like. Part of the fun in those Bethesda games is the exploration and the wandering, or wandering, sorry. I don't know, I just feel like that's totally ripped out of the game. But anyways, back to the update. An actually detailed map, and I've seen it. It looks so much better. The fact that that wasn't in there, day one, is kind of a, is, is a damn shame. It's a damn shame, because you wouldn't even want to look at your map, because it would be just so useless, Again, it's just like a, bl- a gray, pixely area of a map. It has your location, your ship's location, nothing to detail, no like anything that resembles anything on that planet, and icons spread out where there's points of interest, and that is it. That was all the map would tell you. Essentially nothing, no no detail whatsoever in any of that. And it was like, well, this just feels, um, how do I say, still incomplete. Which is insane to think because that game got delayed an entire year. And still kind of, you know, I'll give it this. When it came out, it worked. It didn't crash, it didn't break. There weren't any malfunctions or bugs that would destroy the game or do anything like that. It worked, right? But it just still wasn't quite where it needed to be. And I think now, after watching, you know, what's going to be in this update and seeing what they're putting in, the 60 FPS, the uh, uh, the map upgrades, um, that to me, you know, while it's small, it's details I think that needed to be there. To make it, you know, a better experience, I think. Um, I mean, especially 60 frames per second. I mean, Jesus Christ, guys. Jesus, I mean, if you're adding it in now, why could it not have been done before? Like, was there more that needed to be worked on that, be, and, and you essentially couldn't put it in there because um, the reasons you probably can't even talk about? Like, what was purpose i have no idea it makes no sense to me um i just feel like it's you know finally a a decent upgrade a decent patch to a game that i have since abandoned i have not gone back to it yet but maybe maybe the 60 fps will be enough to get me back into it even though i hate the fast traveling aspect i really 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 don't like it at all if you play the main, and I've been just doing side quests, so maybe if I, I go to the main quest and and start doing that more, I'll have more fun that way. So far, these side quests have just not been it for me. They've been taking me all over the place and, and, and going places where I'm like, what am I doing? Like, why am I just, this is just, it feels like a chore. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I have to go back and try it out because, you know, I I ended up buying the game because I loved the cover of Starfield. I thought it was an incredible game cover. I'm like, I need to own this for myself. So I bought it. So I might as well complete it, but I don't know. Like All right, I have my I'm already playing Diablo. I'm I'm back into uh uh Fallout 4. I just, I'm playing more Jedi Survivor, like, I I got a lot on my plate, I'm trying to complete the Fallout show, I need to start Shogun, like, I gotta do a lot of stuff, there's a lot on my plate right now, Uh, but moving on, past week, we had the NFL Draft, one of the best days on the calendar of the football year, now, I love the draft, the draft is one of the best days of the year for me. I mean, it is an event. I don't go crazy. I don't do like a draft party, but I do make it known that, hey, people, this is the NFL draft. This is where the season begins 
for me in late April, and I am sitting my ass on the couch every single year and watching the NFL draft unfold, at least the first round, because usually I have time to watch the first round every single year. And my God, this might have been the best draft that I've ever seen. The most electric NFL draft that I've seen. With all the hype, with all the storylines of who's going to go where, who's going where, like, are they actually going to go there, um, you know, to who's in the draft. I mean, this draft was phenomenal. It was unbelievable. It was somewhat predictable, but also there was a lot of drama here and there. Um, I just kind of want to go through like some of the top picks that uh, that that went on in the draft and just kind of talk a little bit about them and give my thoughts and opinions on who got drafted and where they're going. Number one pick, Caleb Williams of the Chicago Bears. That was a no doubter. I knew for the I just knew that he was going to go there. I knew that there was reports of he didn't work out with the Bears. The Bears don't like him. He doesn't like the Bears. I'm like that. None of that is going to matter. I don't believe in any of that bullshit. I truly think that that's all just made up noise to throw people off the scent. I don't know who's starting that or who's who's creating that, but like that shit is like some of the most unbelievable trash you could possibly read or watch or listen to people talk about. But he's going to the Bears and I think that he's going to, you know, have a pretty solid year. He's a pretty damn good quarterback. The dude can make so many throws um, in in the pocket, on the run. He can even run a little bit. Like He has been compared a lot to Patrick Mahomes. I do see it. I think that the only reason that this guy does not succeed is if the Chicago Bears end up failing him because he is a very good talent. He's a, he's a, a guy who is the talent is clearly there. The coachability is there with uh, Lincoln Riley at USC. I think that he was able to make him a really good quarterback. Now it's all up to the Chicago Bears coaches. Can they make him a good quarterback? I think that they can. He does seem like a little bit of a diva, more of a, uh, a me, me, me type of quarterback, which, listen, they all are, but this guy just seems a little bit more verbal with it. A little bit more showy with it, like he he knows that he is the, you know, going to be the starting quarterback. He's made it very clear, like he is the guy, he's the guy in Chicago, and he's got if he's going to talk the talk, he's going to have to walk the walk, and we will see in this year if Caleb Williams can be that guy. The number two pick was, um, wow, this isn't even in order. That's that's crazy. Um, Jaden Daniels to um, uh, the Commanders. I honestly have not seen much of Jaden Daniels' tape, much of his games. I know he just won the Heisman this year. That's all I really know. But I feel like the Commanders needed a quarterback. They needed it him. Uh, they needed one badly last year. Um, the Sam Howell experiment failed. It, it, I honestly feel like they probably didn't give him much of a shot, you know, to be honest. But like, uh, clearly that failed. So did the, uh, um, the coach there, Ron Rivera, is gone, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. I feel like with that situation, um, getting Dan Quinn to be their new starting or their their new head coach is a right move. And also getting like the the Heisman winning quarterback is also a pretty damn good move. If you're going to be like hitting the reset button on the franchise, like we got to be good. Uh, let's uh, let's start. Let's uh, take some big steps here. Drake May to the Patriots at number three. That to me was a. Uh, I mean, I, I I honestly have not seen much of Drake May's quarterback play in college. I'm going to just be like, you know, I'll trust the Patriots that they know what they're doing. I mean, they didn't know what they were doing when they drafted Mac Jones. 
But Bill Belichick is no longer the coach there, the head coach at least. So I'm going to say, like, maybe I'll give him a shot. You know, Drake May is not the most stylish quarterback out there. He can throw the ball pretty hard, pretty good. He's more athletic than I think people give him credit for. But I think that, you know, ultimately, will he survive the new Patriots regime under Gerard Mayo and Robert Kraft? Like, this is going to be an entire rebuilding experience. You know, new head coach, new coaching staff, new quarterback. This going to work? I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'm going to skip down a little bit to some notable ones. Uh, Rome Adunze, the receiver from uh, um, Washington State also, or Washington, also went to the Chicago Bears. So now Caleb Williams is going to have an arsenal of receivers, you know, on the Bears. He's going to have um, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Rome Adunze, I mean, this guy is going to be, you know, absolutely set up to have some immediate success. It's going to be all, you know, depending on how he plays and how he's coached and how the coaches use these players in this situation. This is going to be very telling because if, um, what's his name, Matt Eberflus, the head coach, and the coordinators are not able to use and smartly utilize the talent that they have on their roster, at least on offense, Like then this is going to be like, well, if it's not the players, it's definitely the coaches because they have not had like some, some consistent success on offense for the past two years. Now you got players. You got players that can make plays all over the field offensively. Even DeAndre Swift at running back, Cole Komet at tight end. Like, you got boys that could score you touchdowns. If you all can't put it together, it ain't going to be the players' fault, at least in this first year. It's going to be the coaches. So, they have the keys. They have the keys to the castle, to success. They just got to know what locks to use them in in order to unlock the success. Now, that means that Chicago is going to be a uh, a team that's going to be heavily looked at this year to see, are these fuckers for real? Do they have what it takes to, um, to be a winning team? Is it possible for them to do anything good? Is it? I just, we'll have to wait and see, but Chicago 100% is going to be a team to watch in this upcoming NFL season. One that I didn't mention that I, that I just skipped was Michael Penix Jr. to the Falcons. Michael Penix Jr. at number eight pick to the Falcons. That blew everyone's mind when it happened. If you know the story of what's happening, you know, Kirk Cousins signs a two year. Uh, over a hundred million dollar contract, um, with Atlanta to be their starting quarterback, and the Falcons just go kind of go behind his back and don't even tell him that they're going to draft a quarterback and draft Michael Penix Jr. at the no- uh, eighth overall overall pick. And I was thinking to myself, like, whoa. Like, they, didn't they, they just not sign Kirk Cousins like a few months ago? And then I really had to hunker down and look at all the evidence and look at all the all the facts of what's going on. And I had to remember, Kirk Cousins had a season-ending Achilles injury last season. Not at the midway point, but like somewhere like in the first, like, maybe seven weeks, six or seven weeks, I don't know, I could be wrong, but he had an Achilles injury that ended his season, and the dude's 36. I would guess that, you know, Atlanta's in a position where they're like, we can not, you know, just 
I mean, it w- they would probably be like, we are hoping that Kirk Cousins could be stay healthy the entire year, the entire season. But in case it doesn't happen, we need a backup, and we need someone who could potentially become the starter who is going to be the backup in this coming his coming rookie his rookie year this year. And I think that's why they, you know, they got Michael Penix because they're like we cannot have this uh, instability at the quarterback position because it is such a vital position that we need to have. If not, we will die. Not really die, but we will fail immensely as a football team if we don't have a quarterback. So that to me was a crazy pick. That was me just being, I was shocked. I was like, I couldn't believe it. Or I was like, what? I was just shocked. I had no idea that that was going to happen. I was thinking for sure, like, you know, anybody else, but Michael Penix. I was like, huh? Maybe even like, you know, J.J. McCarthy or Bo Nix, but Michael Penix, I was like, yo, may, they probably just, they got to just like love this guy that they needed to get him right now when they had the chance. That's what I love, bro. But that's it. I just love the draft. It's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a thing where I, I just, yeah, it's an event for me, like not like a big fancy event, but I just love watching the drama and seeing where these guys are going to be for their net for their like foreseeable future at least like four years of where they're going to be draft day the nfl draft day is just a a thing that i just like i love watching it's like you're watching a dude's career or the next chapter in this dude's story continue like next chapter turning now he's in the nfl and now we're going to see if he can be as good or not better than he was in college in the nfl it's a really, really cool thing to see. Moving on, though, a little bit of uh, NBA playoff news. The uh, Lakers have been eliminated from the playoffs. Um, the Phoenix Suns have been eliminated from the playoffs. One team has LeBron James and Anthony Davis. The other team has... Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, and Kevin Durant. Eliminated from the playoffs. Two cornerstone stars of the NFL have been swept in this year's playoffs. It's unbelievable how we can think, how we can see that Kevin Durant, LeBron James, and he wasn't in it to begin with, but even Steph Curry are not in this year's playoff picture. You know who is, though? You know who is? Jalen Brunson, Anthony Edwards, um, who who else? Tyrese Halliburton, Paolo Bancaro, Chet Holmgren, SGA. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the new generation in the NBA currently in the playoffs right now. We have this upcoming generation in the playoffs. We have a couple that are still from a previous generation. Joel Embiid has not been eliminated yet. Um, Let's see who else has not been eliminated. Uh, That has been in... Oh, Giannis. Well, not Giannis, but Damian Lillard has not yet been eliminated. Giannis Antetokounmpo is not gone yet. Uh, James Harden is still in the playoffs. Kawhi Leonard, even though he's not playing. Paul George is still in the playoffs. So it's got a little bit of a mixed bag. It's a a mixed bag with the current generation and the up-and-coming one that are currently in the playoffs. But the ones that have not made it, the big ones, like I just said, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Steph Curry, Anthony Davis... All not in the playoffs. Wow. Who would have thought? I guess time really does win all battles. And I gotta say, man, having watched some of these playoff games, the Lakers tried so damn hard against the Nuggets, but the Nuggets are just better. They have the best player in the world. And Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray... 
you know, Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter Jr., a great head coach, and Michael Malone, like, they are such a deep team where LeBron James and Anthony Davis just could not do it by themselves. They could not do it. And I don't blame them. You know, Denver is still young enough, still dominant enough, still powerful enough to just not even bat an eye, not even really break a sweat against these guys, not really feel like they're in any emit danger while playing the Lakers. It was too easy. On the other side, you have, you know, a team with uh, in Phoenix with uh, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, who cannot get it together at all. And let a young team, a younger team, maybe not the youngest, but with Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, and, uh, you know, a couple other boys in their size, just bully the fuck out of the Suns and s- completely silence Devin Booker and Kevin Durant and got swept. Unbelievable. Crazy. Anthony Edwards is that guy, though. Like, he is a old school fella. Where he will talk shit, talk trash, compete extremely, extremely hard, really want to beat you down, and he did. He was the conquering hero. Bro, that poster, he posterized KD in the final game. Like, he jumped over him. KD just essentially surrendered. At at that point, I think that... When Anthony Edwards dunked on Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant in that moment surrendered his NBA dominance to the next generation. KD in that series looked old. He looked slow. He looked tired. He looked like he had nothing in his bag of tricks, nothing in the tank at all. He looked Empty, confused, out of ammo. He did not have it. And it was crazy. It was sad. I was seeing him miss open jumpers, get bullied, get sped on, get dunked on. I mean, it was sad. If he cannot bounce back within, like, the next couple years, if he decides to keep playing... Man, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough look for Kevin Durant in future. I don't know. I'm just thinking like that this past like playoff performance, this series, he looked very, 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 very weak, very undominant, not, not, no, no killer instinct whatsoever in his game. Now you got, you know, Philadelphia and, and, and then New York still going at it. Um, uh, yeah, Milwaukee and Indiana still playing Cleveland and Orlando still playing Boston, Miami still playing like, um, it's a lot going on, but yeah, I mean, just the, the fall of the previous generation, the previous generation is on its way out and just seeing how LeBron and KD have gone out in these playoffs is, you know, crazy. Going out and going to Cancun. You know, have some fun, boys. You know, you, you'll you'll probably need it, you know. In order to wash away the filth of this past uh, season, you might have to just take that trip to Cancun. And a little bit of, you know, other news in the NBA. Bronny James is not a good player offensively and defensively and, and defensively he's not a very good player but i just saw yesterday that the lakers are trying to draft bronny james so lebron james could fulfill his dream of playing basketball with his son on the Lakers. Man, I mean, like, this, I don't like this. I really don't. I think that 
this is just a, not a stunt, but like not in the best nature of the team. You know what I'm saying? Like, Bronny James is not a player that probably should be in the NBA right now. He's got a lot more to learn. He's got to develop a lot more. I think that, you know, he's got to be, you know, he's got to learn more about basketball and about where he fits on a team, his best role, and what he's good at, what he could get better at, and how he can improve. And the Lakers want to get him just so he can play with LeBron. You know, they're probably going to get him. You know why? Because LeBron has so much power over that team and over what that team does. He has the Lakers organization on a leash. And he will not allow them to not pick up Bronny James. He will make them do that and make them give up a roster spot to his son who has no business on being on any NBA roster right now. He really doesn't, which shows you his control and his power and his unwillingness to do and get his way whichever way possible. I saw this break on X. Like this 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 uh, this story came out on X that it was actually being talked about. Like it was actually a possibility and I thought to myself like this dude LeBron man is so selfish. He really is going to put his son on the team just so he can play basketball with him on the Lakers because that's what he wants to do. Sacrifice the improvement of a team that needs improvement to put a dude on there who's going to play like maybe two minutes of every game. You know, maybe even two minutes his entire career that year just to get the pictures, just to get the things of him being on the court together. Oh, Bronny assists LeBron or LeBron assists Bronny or alley oop to Bronny, alley oop to LeBron, whatever. You know, they'll get that moment, they'll cherish that moment. Yes, it'll be nice. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's all pomp and circumstance. It's all for show. It's all for shock value. And let's get as much eyes on this game in particular as possible. Let's cash in with the cool photos, with the cool things. We'll put on some cool caption on this photo of Bronny and LeBron, and we'll sell it. We'll sell some LeBron James jerseys. We'll sell some Bronny James jerseys, and we'll make a bitch-ass ton of money, and then that's it. It seems like what it's all going to lead to. Now, of course, that's only if the Lakers actually draft. They only draft um, LeBron or Bronny James, which, you know, I do think will happen because that that guy, LeBron, he just has so much power. I don't know. It seems inevitable that he's going to do it, but I don't know. I I really hope not, but I do think that because Bronny has declared for the draft, but also is going to keep his eligibility eligibility um, alive, or you know still have it, you know they'll probably just still draft him, and it's going to be weird as shit. Um, let's see. Last thing I wanted to talk about. Quick thing before I get the hell out of here. Um, Chris Hemsworth. You know, the guy who played Thor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is taking the blame. Taking the blame for Thor Love and Thunder's failure. Quote, I got caught up in the improv and the wackiness and became a parody of myself. Yeah. No shit. I mean, like, if you had seen that movie, sir. Like, that movie is so terrible. That was a quote. He continues to say, Sometimes I felt like a security guard for the team, Hemsworth said. I would read everyone else's lines and go, Oh, they got a way cooler stuff. They're having more fun. What's my character doing? It was always about, You've got the wig on. You've got the muscles. You've got the costume. What's the... um, Where's the lightning? Yeah, I'm part of this big thing, but I'm probably pretty replaceable. Um, that end quote. That was his quote. Uh, 
I don't think that, you know, you know, he should be, it seems like with that quote, like he was saying, like they get the cool lines, um, and they're having more fun. What's my character doing? You know, it was always, uh, you've got on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just like he, he felt like he was, I guess, being left out in this movie. It seems like, you know, he was kind of jealous that these other characters were getting cooler things and cooler lines to say. And that he, I guess he was feeling replaceable, which is, that that's weird because Thor is a, is a main character in the movie or was is supposed to be it's titled Thor Love and Thunder you're supposed to be the main character he's saying that he's not getting any cool lines to say is one of two things one the writer didn't want you to have a good part in the movie the movie was not meant for you to have any cool lines which is kind of weird because it's a Thor movie two you wanted more, so you kind of became more... Sounds like he, be, he became more in charge of what was going on in the movie and gave himself, like, wacky things to say, and they're like, oh, yeah, you can do that, sure. In the midst, it became a absolutely terrible mess of wackiness and stupidity, which is what that movie is. It's stupid. It's one of the... It, it's, it's my... I hate that movie. I hate it. And, um... It seems like it was just kind of ruined because I, I guess because Chris Hemsworth say, you know, him taking this blame that, you know, I blame myself for making it too wacky and too stupid. It seems like because you felt like jealous that you weren't getting any cool things to say, which is very strange because it's like, did they make the movie for you? Did they make the movie so you were barely in it? And you're like, wait, guys, I'm still here. Like, don't freaking like <laughs> forget about me. Then I would question the writer, which is Taika Waititi. Like, okay, bro, like, what? Were you not planning to have Chris Hemsworth be, like, the main dude in the Thor movie that you're writing? Like, what's going on here? Um, That kind of, you know, makes more sense in the way he made it wacky because he didn't like what he was saying, that his character seemed boring, and that, you know, to, to that point, like... Well, what were the writers doing? What were they thinking? I mean, what is this shit? You know, why are you making your story so bad? You know, where your actors like complain, like, my shit sucks. Where's my cool stuff? The main guy in the movie, Thor, has got boring shit. It's got not cool things. What's going on? It's a, it's a quite a thing to ponder. It's quite a thing to think about. Like, hey, well, you know, what, what, what actually, what is going on here? What what actually is happening with this movie? You know, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it didn't make any money. It was a, it was a financial failure, and it was a bad movie. It didn't make it was a, it was a legit a legitimately a bad movie. And I think if you watch it, you'll be like, yeah, this thing fucking sucks. And I'm glad I didn't watch it in theaters. So that all kind of makes sense now. You know, you read these quotes, you kind of read into them, you see what he's saying, and you're like. And there's some things at work here that, you know, could have made, that kind of made, seems like made, this stuff made the movie as bad as it did. And it's not something, like, you want to hear your star say, but also, like, you kind of have to answer, answer the questions to the crime. The questions being, uh, leading from the crime, that you made the worst Marvel movie ever made. A really, really bad movie. And it's like, whew. What were y'all thinking when you made this shit? Now I guess we kind of know. Now I guess we know. And that's going to be it for me today, people. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Remember, you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube at Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. New episodes drop every Thursday morning. Make sure to like, subscribe, rate, review, and do all that good stuff. And yes, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will see you guys next week. 